Section 5.2, Diagonalization. Products of the form P inverse AP, in which A and P are n by n matrices and P is invertible, can be viewed as transformations from A to P inverse AP, in which the matrix A is mapped into the matrix P inverse AP. These are called similarity transformations. In general, any property that is preserved by a similarity transformation is called a similarity invariant and is said to be invariant under similarity. So we have a whole bunch of different similarity invariants that we summarize in this table over here. The determinant, A and P inverse AP have the same determinant. Invertibility, A is invertible if and only if P inverse AP is invertible. Rank, A and P inverse AP have the same rank. Nullity, A and P inverse AP have the same nullity. Trace, A and P inverse AP have the same trace. Characteristic polynomial, eigenvalues, and eigenspace dimension. If lambda is an eigenvalue of A, and hence P inverse AP, then the eigenspace of A corresponding to lambda and the eigenspace of P inverse AP corresponding to lambda have the same dimension. Next up, we have some definitions. If A and B are square matrices, then we say that B is similar to A if there is an invertible matrix P such that B is P inverse AP. Note that if B is similar to A, then it is also true that A is similar to B, since we can express A as Q inverse BQ by taking Q to be P inverse. So A would also have to be a similar matrix. So this being the case, we will usually say that A and B are similar matrices if either is similar to the other one. A square matrix A is said to be diagonalizable if it is similar to some diagonal matrix. That is, if there exists an invertible matrix P, such that that P inverse AP matrix we keep talking about is diagonal. In this case, the matrix P is said to diagonalize A. So we have a theorem for uh, diagonalization. If A is an n by n matrix, the following statements are equivalent. A is diagonalizable, and A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Let's prove this real quick. First, uh, the proof that if we have A true, then B has to be true, so A implies B. Since A is assumed to be diagonalizable, in this case we're assuming A is diagonalizable, we're going to prove that that means that it has to have n linearly independent eigenvectors. It follows that there exists an invertible matrix P and a diagonal matrix D such that P inverse AP is D, or equivalently, we'll just uh, multiply the left side of this equation and this equation by P. So P will cancel P inverse, and we'll get AP equals PD. If we denote the column vectors of P by P1 through PN, and if we assume that the diagonal entries of D are lambda 1 through lambda N, then the left side of this equation can be expressed as that AP over there, can be expressed as A times P, 1 through PN for the P. So then we can move in the A by distributing and see that that's AP1, AP2, and so on. The right side, that PD, remember we're expressing uh, P as all of the column vectors, P1 through PN, and then D is the diagonal matrix. So we'll just take lambda1 through lambda n and multiply those P's, because those are the diagonal entries of D. Okay, so then that means that we can equate both sides. We have AP1, equals lambda p1, we have ap2 equals lambda p2, just by going off both sides of this equation. So we get ap1 equals lambda p1 all the way through apn equals lambda pn. Since b is invertible, we know that its column vectors, p1 through pn, are linearly independent, hence not zero, thus it follows that these n column vectors are eigenvectors of a. Now let's do the other direction. Let's prove that if we assume that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors, then that means that A is diagonalizable. Okay, so if we assume that A is n linearly independent eigenvectors, we'll call them uh, P1 through Pn, and that lambda 1 through lambda n are the corresponding eigenvalues. Let's let P equal a P, the matrix built out of all of those column vectors, as before, and let's let D be the diagonal matrix that has lambda 1 through lambda n as its successive diagonal entries. So then we can write AP as A times P1 through PN, distribute the A's again, but then 
that's got to be equal to lambda 1 times p1 through and so on through lambda npn, which is pd. So since the column vectors of p are linearly independent, it follows that p is invertible. So this last equation can be written as p inverse ap equals d. In other words, we multiply both sides over here by p inverse. And that proves that a is diagonalizable by definition. Next up, we have a theorem that if lambda 1 through lambda k are distinct eigenvalues of a matrix A, and if v1 through vk are corresponding eigenvectors, then v1 through vk is a linearly independent set. An n by n matrix with n distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable. Let's use all of these results and do an example. How about we find a matrix P that diagonalizes this matrix A? Remember that this matrix should seem a little bit familiar because we found the characteristic equation in example 7 of uh, section 5.1, the previous section. So by example 7 of 5.1, that implies that our characteristic equation is lambda minus 1 times lambda minus 2 squared equals 0. Okay, so when lambda equals 2, that gives us two vectors for our uh, basis for the uh, eigenspace. The only reason we know that is because we actually went through and solved the equation lambda i minus ax equals 0 in example 7 to find those two basis vectors. It's just a coincidence that lambda happens to be equal to 2. So I'm going to write one of those vectors as p1. You might remember that was minus 1, 0, 1. That was the first vector we saw for. And the other basis vector I'll write as p2. That was 0, 1, 0. And then our other eigenvalue, lambda equals 1, gave us one more vector. We'll call that p3 for its eigenspace basis. And that was minus 2, 1, 1. So now that we have the bases for the eigenspaces, we put them all together and we build the matrix P out of those columns. So P will be minus 1, 0, 1 for P1, 0, 1, 0 for P2, and minus 2, 1, 1 for P3. To show that this actually does diagonalize A, we can compute P inverse AP. So P inverse AP would equal 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, minus 1. I didn't show the actual computation for P inverse, but you could find the uh, inverse of this guy and you know work out the details, and then you'll see that it equals this. Now multiply by A which equals 0, 0, minus 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0, 3. And I'll multiply by p, which is minus 1, 0, minus 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And you'll see that you get 2, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1. Fortunately, that matrix actually is diagonal. So gives us hope that we have the right answer. Let's do another example and show that the following matrix is not diagonalizable. OK, so we'll start by finding the eigenvalues and then try to find the uh, vectors that make up the eigenspaces, the bases. So we'll start with the equation, the determinant of lambda i minus a. So that would be the determinant of lambda minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, lambda minus 2, 0, 3, minus 5, 
and lambda minus 2. Okay, computing this determinant, let's see, we could just take lambda minus 1, and multiply it by this determinant, the 0 will kill that, so it's just lambda minus 1 times lambda minus 2 squared. And then the zeros don't contribute anything, by, just by cofactoring. So lambda minus 1 times lambda minus 2 squared. Okay, so that means that I have lambda equals 1 and lambda equals 2 as my eigenvalues. So now how about I look at the equation lambda i minus a times x equals 0. And that's the same thing as lambda minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, lambda minus 2, 0, 3, minus 5, lambda minus 2, times an arbitrary vector x, we'll call that x1, x2, x3, and that should equal the 0 vector. Okay, so now if we look at lambda equals 1, our first eigenvalue, then plugging that in, we get 1 minus 1 is 0, and then 0, and then 0, and I'll adjoin a, a final column of zeros so I can get my augmented matrix. So then still plugging in lambda equals 1, so 1 minus 2 is another minus 1, 0, 0, and 3 minus 5 I keep, and then lambda minus 2 is uh, 1 minus 2 is another minus 1. Okay, so I want to reduce this. So I'll move this line to the top and multiply it by minus 1 so I can get 1, 1, 0, 0. And then I'll subtract off three of them from this guy so that I can get zeros underneath. And I'll move this to my uh, second row and I'll move the column of zero, the row of zeros to my last row. So I'll get 0, minus 8, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then I'll finish off by dividing that by minus 8 and subtracting off suitable multiple so that I can get a 0 over there. So I'll get 1, 0, minus 1, 8, 0, 0, 1, 1 eighth, 0, and my row of zeros. Okay, wonderful. So that means that my top equation is x1, 0, x3, so minus 1 eighth, 0, x2, so minus 1 eighth, x3 equals 0. And my second equation, 0, x1, so x2 plus 1 eighth x3 equals 0. Okay, so how about I set x3 as my free variable equal to some parameter t. So that means that solving for x1, we get that x1 is 1 eighth t, x2 is minus 1 eighth t, and x3 is just t. Okay, so that means that my vector x is equal to 1 eighth uh, t minus 1 eighth t t. And I'll factor out t. And I'll get 1 eighth minus 1 eighth 1. So that means that that's going to be my uh, p1 because it's my basis for my eigenspace. Okay, so I get 1 eighth minus 1 eighth 1. Okay, how about we do the same thing now for lambda 2, or lambda 2 equals 2, the second eigenvalue. So plugging in over here, we get that 2 minus 1 is 1, and 0, 0, 0, 
minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, minus 5, 0, 0. So we're just doing the exact same thing again. We'll reduce this. Uh, let's see, we can cancel out this guy by adding the top row and then move this row to the second. And we can just add negative 3 divided by 2. It won't affect these guys. So we'll just get 1, 0, 0, 0 for the top row. And the second one just becomes 0, 1, 0, 0. And the last row will just be zeros after we move this canceled out one down there. Okay, wonderful. So that means that x1 is equal to 0. x2 is equal to 0 also. And x3 is a free variable, so we'll just set that equal to t. So summarizing, we have x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, and x3 equals uh, t. Okay, so that means that our vector x clean that up, x is equal to 0, 0, t for lambda equals 2. So that means that I can factor out the t and get 0, 0, 1. And I'll set p2 equal to 0, 0, 1. Um, that's it though, because we only had two eigenvalues. So that means that we only have p1 and p2. We don't have a p3. So there's no way to build our matrix P to diagonalize this matrix because we only have two vectors across all our um, eigenspace bases. So this matrix is not diagonalizable as we've shown. Another way to see this, by the way, if you didn't want to actually go through the trouble of computing P1 and P2, is once you get to this point, you can realize that the matrix is of rank 2. This matrix is rank 2. Altogether, the rank and the nullity have to add up to 3. So that means that the nullity has to be equal to 1. So that means that there's only one vector and the basis for the eigenspace. And similarly, this matrix is also of rank 2 which tells you for the, by the same reasoning that there's only one vector in the basis for the eigenspace. So that tells you that you only have two vectors. You don't even have to actually compute what the vectors are. Just knowing that there's only two when you need three shows that the matrix is not diagonalizable. Next up, how about we show that this matrix A is diagonalizable. So we looked at this matrix in uh, example three of the previous section and we saw that that gave us eigenvalues lambda equals 4 and lambda equals 2 plus rad 3 and 2 minus rad 3. Okay so that means that we have P inverse AP equal to the diagonal matrix 4, 0, 0, 0, 2 plus rad 3, 0, 0, 0, 2 minus rad 3, 4, some P. Right? Because these are the uh, eigenvalues. They go along that diagonal for that uh, diagonal matrix. Notice we didn't bother to actually compute what the matrix P is. That would be uh, a bit of work. We have to get the bases for the eigenspaces. But the question didn't ask that. It just says show it's diagonalizable. And it is because it has those three eigenvalues. So we can just throw them along the diagonal. How about we show that uh, this matrix is diagonalizable? Well. Notice that uh, we have eigenvalues that we can just read off because it's upper triangular. So our first eigenvalue is negative 1, the first diagonal entry. Then we've got another eigenvalue of 3, uh, an eigenvalue of 5, and an eigenvalue of minus 2. 
Okay, so we can see that uh, we have four eigenvalues. We can just put them along the diagonal for a diagonalization for a diagonal matrix that'll diagonal that um, it'll be the diagonalization for some p. We don't have to actually compute what the p is, but this kind of lends credence to the fact that we could just say that in general a uh, triangular matrix with distinct entries on the main diagonal is diagonalizable. Okay, if k is a positive integer, lambda is an eigenvalue of a matrix A, and x is a corresponding eigenvector, then lambda k is an eigenvalue of ak, and x is a corresponding eigenvector. In example two, we found the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors of the matrix A. Let's do the same thing for A to the seventh. It's pretty easy using this theorem. For A, we got that lambda equals one, lambda equals two, and we got our um, eigenvectors p1 and p2. So for a to the seventh, then that's just uh, one to the seventh for the first lambda. So that's just one. And then the other one would be two to the seventh. So that's 128 for my other eigenvalue, and then the eigenvectors are still p1 and p2. Suppose that A is a diagonalizable n by n matrix, and that P diagonalizes A, and that P inverse AP equals this uh, D. If K is a positive integer, then A to the K equals PD to the K times P inverse which is p times the diagonal matrix with all of the entries raised to the k. That makes sense given the previous theorem, right? So how about we find a to the 13th, where a is this matrix right over here. So uh, by example one, we have that p is equal to minus 1, 0, minus 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And that means well, we also have uh, D equals P inverse AP is equal to 2, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1. That's our diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues along the diagonal. So that means that by our remark, a to the 13th is equal to p d to the 13th p inverse. So that's minus 1, 0, minus 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and we'll multiply that by d to the 13th. Easy to take powers of diagonal matrices is much easier than uh, this thing if we were to conventionally do it. That's just 2 to the 13th, 0, 0, 0, 2 to the 13th, 0, 0, 0, 1 to the 13th times p inverse, which is 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1. And we can compute that that is minus 81, 90, 0, minus uh, 16,382, 
16,383. And that would be pretty annoying to compute by multiplying this thing 13 times. And it's still kind of annoying to compute it this way, but not nearly as annoying. You could actually potentially do it by hand if you know 2 to the 13th. How about we use the matrices i and j to show that the converse of theorem 5.2.2. Uh, B is false. So let's go back a second. So an n by n matrix with n distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable. We're trying to show that uh, if we have a diagonalizable matrix, it does not necessarily have n distinct eigenvalues. So let's go back to our example and show that we can have matrices that don't necessarily have the uh, requisite number of eigenvalues just because they're diagonalizable or not diagonalizable. It doesn't really imply anything. Notice both of these matrices have ones along the main diagonal, the triangular matrices. So we have that the only eigenvalue is lambda equals one. So let's look at the equations lambda i minus, or uh, i in this case, because it is the identity. That's the one we're looking at. And that equals 0. And we're going to see that uh, also we'll want to do the same thing for lambda i minus j. OK, so taking lambda is 1. 1 minus 1 gives us 0 along the main diagonal, and then minus all the other ones is just already 0. So this is just a matrix of zeros. And then I'll adjoin the 0 vector so that I get an augmented matrix of all zeros. OK, great. It's already reduced. Um, every single variable is a free variable, so I'm going to set them all equal to the parameters, so x1 equal r, x2 I'll set equal s, and x3 equal to t. Let's uh, do the same thing for my other matrix at the same time. So I've got 0, I've got because 1 minus 1 is 0, I've got minus 1 over here because minus, minus 0 is still 0. I join my column of zeros, I've got 0. Uh, 1 minus 1 is 0, and then minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK, so that means that I could say that x1 is equal to 0, x2 is equal to 0, and x3 is equal to r. x3 is my free variable. So that means that I end up with, in the case I'm looking at matrix i, I have x equals r s t. And I'll pull out r times 1, 0, 0. Add that to s times 0, 1, 0. And add that to t times 0, 0, 1. And then over here for j, I'll get that x is 0, 0, r. So that gives me r times 0, 0, 1 when I factor it out. So notice that I've got on my left for i three different basis vectors. So I could set p1 equal to 1, 0, 0, p2 equal to 0, 1, 0, 
and p3 equal to 0, 0, 1. Great, so I have three vectors, I can form P. So that means that I is diagonalizable. Even though I uh, only has one eigenvalue. Notice on the other hand that J only has the vector P1. So I don't have three vectors, so it's not diagonalizable. So knowing that we had fewer eigenvalues does uh, did not give us any information about whether the matrix would be diagonalizable or not. It could be diagonalizable or it could not be. Knowing the number of eigenvalues doesn't tell you whether or not the matrix would be diagonalizable. If lambda 0 is an eigenvalue of an n by n matrix A, then the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to lambda 0 is called the geometric multiplicity of lambda 0, and the number of times that lambda minus lambda 0 appears as a factor in the characteristic polynomial of A is called the algebraic multiplicity of lambda 0. If A is a square matrix, then for every eigenvalue of A, the geometric multiplicity is less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity, and a is diagonalizable if and only if the geometric multiplicity of every eigenvalue is equal to the algebraic multiplicity.